Mark chapter number 12. About a year and a half ago, I started a series uh, going through the gospel according to Mark, and I intended just to kind of go uh, through bigger chunks of the book and just cover the life of Christ, but I get distracted easy, and there's things, passages that come up that I don't feel I can skip, and so, um, so anyways, we, it's gone a little, it's taken a bit longer than I planned, and then once COVID started, I stopped the series just to kind of deal with some other things, but uh, now that things are looking like, at least supposed to be getting back to normal, um, I, we may not be in Mark every Sunday morning, but I would like to finish it eventually. <laughs> uh, so that'll be good. Mark chapter number 12, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1 and read down through verse 12. Mark 12, verses 1 through 12. Jesus says, well, we've, beginning of verse number 1 says, and he spake, and he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard. And set a hedge about it, and digged a place for the wine fat, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And at the season he went to the husbandmen, he's, I'm sorry, I can't read this morning, he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him, and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant, and at him they cast stones, and wounded him in the head. And sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. God, I thank you for the clarity and the power of Scripture. Lord Jesus, you spoke these words to religious people that were rejecting you and made them angry. Father, we need to learn what you were trying to tell them. So speak to us, I pray. Open our eyes to the, not just the reality of the truth there, but the reality of our own life now. God, if we are in any way an ounce of what these Pharisees and scribes were, convict us so deeply that we want to get rid of that sin. God, help us, please. Move us, change us, help us to see the truth. In Jesus' name we pray and ask for your help for me and for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> There's a story told of a woman who had finished shopping and she was walking to her car and she gets, she gets to her car, and she drops her shopping bags. She draws a gun, and she, see, when she sees inside of her car, uh, four men inside of her car. And so she draws her gun, and she says, I have a gun, and I know how to use it. Get out. So the guys, they, they, they jump out of the car. They, get, they go running like crazy. And the woman's shaking. She grabs her shopping bags again. She goes to get in her car. She goes to crank it, and it won't crank. She tries and tries and tries, and her car won't crank. She gets out of the car, and she looks, and five spaces down the way was her car. She got in the wrong person's car that looked just like hers. So being totally embarrassed, she gets her groceries. She goes to the police station uh, to report what she had done, and she gets to the, de the desk sergeant, and she tells the whole story, and uh, he's dying laughing at the story, and just down the way from this lady and the desk sergeant are those four men. Uh, they were scared um, out of their wits because she pulled a gun on them, and because they're all laughing at the story, they decide to not file any charges, and they let her go. The whole moral of that story, <laughs> she tried to take something that was not hers. She was fully convinced, at least she didn't mean wrong, she was fully convinced that what she had was hers and belonged to her, and so she tried to take it, and it didn't work out for her. That's kind of what was going on in this story here, spiritually speaking, but on a much more serious level. We, as well as the audience of Jesus' 
they, we understand, I think, what Jesus was trying to say. Uh, we can become convinced that something is ours, but truly it belongs to somebody else. In summary, our life is not ours. Our life is God's. Our time is God's. Everything we have belongs to the Lord, and He deserves, He rightfully deserves to have ownership and control of all of it. In Mark 12, Jesus, He's been facing verbal attacks and arguments by the scribes and Pharisees and the religious leaders. Now, there's lots of religious people, but the religious crowd that find themselves to be superior. And they're, they find themselves to be superior because they live by higher standards. Again, just because you live by higher standards doesn't make you more spiritual, especially when you make up the higher standards. The, 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 the object of our life, the goals of our life, to be obedient to Scripture, and with the Holy Spirit's help, we can do that. The goal is not to be weird. The goal is not to just live by rules. But the, the goal of our life is to, is to love and obey God. So the scribes and Pharisees, they had the rules, but they didn't have the Lord. And that was one of their problems. So Jesus, he, he tells this, this parable to them to make a point of not just a, a scary story, but to tell them what they are. And they don't like it. You can find that at the end. They sought to lay hold on him. They wanted to arrest him. And we find there's several occasions, not just here, but there's at least three occasions where they try to capture Jesus and kill him. The third time... At least the last time we know it actually worked, although Jesus gave up the ghost, but they rested and, had him, had, and they had him killed. But he tells the story. We'll back up in a minute and we'll tell the, the parable. But in verse number 8, speaking of himself, it says, And they took him, the son, and they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. So Jesus is prophesying about what's about to happen to him. And then the question don't ask this morning, what will God do? Verse 9, what shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? When the, when the prophets that come, I'm getting ahead of myself, but when the preachers come, the prophets come, when, when the master sends somebody to get what's rightfully his, when the master, when the Lord sends somebody again and again and again to get to take control of what's rightfully his, and they reject and they fight and they reject and they fight, what will the Lord do? What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandman. will give the vineyard unto others. I'm going to show you three things from this parable. Number one, the doctrine. Number two, the duty. And number three, the danger. And I want us to understand what the parable here is speaking of. That's the most important thing, to understand a Bible passage. Before we know what it's saying to me, I have to know what it said there. So that's really important. So let's talk about the doctrine of this parable. Again, a parable is a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. A heavenly story with an earthly meaning. Jesus used parables oftentimes to share a deeper truth, um, or to share a deeper truth that they just weren't getting. Sometimes Jesus would teach a parable. He'd explain the meaning of the parable, and they still wouldn't get it. Even, you know, sometimes they're as dumb as we can be. Uh, at least, maybe not you, but me. Uh, but Jesus was sharing a parable with, with, uh, with his followers. Remember about the, the, the four different times, types of ground, the good ground? And Jesus explains it, and they're still like, we have no idea what you're trying to tell us, Jesus. So, uh, but sometimes that happens. But sometimes parables were used just to simply make a, a, a truth more understandable. Verse number one, and he began to speak unto them. Who's the them? The them is the, the audience or is the rejecting Pharisees and scribes. So, and he began to speak unto them by a parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to, hus to husbandmen and went into a far country. If this parable sounds somewhat familiar to you, just a few weeks ago in our revival meeting, this parable was mentioned from another passage. And we'll go to Isaiah 5. Go, go ahead and turn to Isaiah 5. And we find the kind of the root of this parable. Sometimes Jesus would teach a lesson or he'd share a parable. And it was, and it was not new. It may be new to us, um, but with the Pharisees here, they knew this story. And the reason why this story was so hard-hitting and why this parable was so convicting is because the Pharisees, they knew exactly what Jesus was trying to tell them. There was no hidden meaning, really. Jesus made it clear. But by the way, before we get to, to reading in Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 4, let me tell you uh, kind of a hint. When you're studying your Bible, especially the, uh, the gospel records and the parables, um, be careful in trying to pull a hidden meaning out of everything. 
sometimes it means exactly what it says, you know. Um, but be careful when, with parables to find every detail, like what does the wine fat mean and what does, uh, what does the wall mean? You can, you can make preaching out of anything if you really try, but don't go any further than what Jesus did. That's a good clue. Be very careful taking doctrine out of a parable where that doctrine is not found anywhere else in the Bible. The parables do teach doctrine, but make sure it's rooted somewhere else so you're not, just, so you're not the master of the doctrine that's being taught. That makes sense. But in Isaiah 5, we find the meaning of it. Isaiah 5, verse 1. It says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. And also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that I should bring, when it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof that it should be eaten up and break down the wall thereof, that it should be trodden down. We'll stop there. Jesus teaches here, and oftentimes in the gospel is about a vineyard. He uses vineyards sometimes to picture other things. But sometimes, or a lot of times in the Old Testament, Jesus used trees or fruit to illustrate his own people. Sometimes it was a fig tree. Sometimes it was an olive tree. Sometimes it was a vineyard, grapes, a vineyard, uh, where they'd get grapes. In Isaiah 5, God, he's teaching. He says, you're the vineyard. And I expected good fruit to come out of it. I wanted grapes, and I got the wild grapes. Brother Weedo preached on that, so I won't re-preach it. Uh, but that was the point. But who is... So the vineyard was the nation of Israel. Here in, in, in Mark, the vineyard is the nation of Israel. More specifically, he's aiming at the leaders of Israel, those religious leaders, but the vineyard is Israel. But who's the master of the vineyard? Who is the owner? Who is the boss? Who is the one that planted it? Who is the one that put them there? God is the man, God is the Lord of the vineyard. So we need to understand that, number one, God, under the doctrine, God is the man and the Lord of the vineyard. God is the boss. Number two, the people of Israel are the husbandmen. They're the, they're the vineyard, they're the ones that are supposed to make the fruit, but they're also the husbandmen. They're the ones responsible to get fruit. So the fruit makers, the vineyard and the husbandmen, are the people, people of Israel. The master says, I'm putting people in charge to get fruit. I expect fruit out of my vineyard. They're supposed to grow fruit. They are the workers entrusted with something. Back in Mark 12, verse 2. And at the season, he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive, the hus- of, receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. Then we find in verses 2 through 5, he did it again. He sent a servant and they beat him. He sent another servant and they'd kill him. He sent another servant and they stoned him. And again and again, he kept sending servants to go to the husbandman and say, it's time for the fruit to come. I want to see spiritual fruit come out of your life. I want, I want something to show for my investment in you. And they wouldn't do it. They had, by the way, they had fruit. But this, one, this parable is a little bit different. They were growing something, perhaps, I guess. But it says, it's time for, to get the fruit. And they said, no, I'm not giving you the fruit. It's mine. So God's desire then was for his chosen people, his vineyard, and his husbandmen to produce fruit. Well, what is the fruit? To honor his word. To worship him in a way that pleases him. For their daily life, not just in the building, the worship place, but in their daily life to please him. To obey the scriptures, to bring him glory. So he sent a servant there to check on them. To collect them, to send a message that it's time to get fruit. But they rejected him. The Lord, so the man, I'm sorry. God is the man and the Lord of the vineyard. Israel and the leaders, they are the vineyard and the husbandmen. What was the purpose? The Lord's desire for the husbandmen was to produce spiritual fruit. But what are the servants? Again and again in Israel's history, God would send servants, would send prophets. It's time for you to get right. There ought to be fruit in your life. God wants to get fruit out of your life. So God would send prophets to remind them, to get on them, and to tell them that uh, what God's expectation was. For example, God sent Elijah. And Elijah, he would preach to kings, he was, but he was constantly running for his life. 
He was chased by Ahab, the king there in Israel, and he was chased by Jezebel, his wicked wife. But his life was constantly threatened. So there was Elijah. There's many more, but there's men like Isaiah. Isaiah warned Israel and Judah, but he too was ignored. History, I don't think the Bible shows, but Isaiah history shows that he was cut in half in death. He was sawn asunder, like Hebrews talks about. God sent Jeremiah. When Judah was finally destroyed by the Babylonians, Jeremiah was the prophet saying, judgment's coming. In fact, Jeremiah was the one saying, judgment is coming now. And God, and, and God sent Jeremiah to say, you still need to get right, even though the destruction is here. You need to get right. So what did they do to Jeremiah? They arrested him. They threw him in a pit. He was too rejected. There's prophet after prophet in the Old Testament, but then there's another prophet sent in the New Testament. There was John the Baptist. Just before Jesus' day, or before Jesus' ministry began, there was John the Baptist. John stood before King Herod and biblically condemned his incestuous and adulterous relationship. So what happened to John the Baptist? Got his head cut off. Some they beat up, some they stoned, some they killed. Again and again, God would send servants, would send prophets. It's time for there to be fruit. It's time for you to get right. It's time for you to give your life, which rightfully belongs to God, to Him. Verse 6 of Matthew 12. I'm sorry, Mark 12. Mark 12, verse 6. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and that the inheritance shall be ours. He sent a prophet. He sent a preacher. The Jews wouldn't listen. For centuries, God sent prophets. He sent preachers, but they wouldn't listen. He says, I'll try one more time. I'm not going to send a prophet this time. I'm going to send my son. Maybe, surely, they'll listen to my son. They'll listen to the only son, the only begotten son of God. Maybe they'll listen, but they didn't. Let us kill him, that the inheritance shall be. What's that last word? If you would look there, the last word of verse number seven, our, the inheritance may be ours. I will keep what I want. I'm not giving it back to God. I'm not giving it back to the Father. I'm not giving it back to the Master there. I will keep what's, what I feel is mine. Jesus, He's the Son. Jesus came to Israel to warn them. He was, there was prophet after prophet after prophet. Now Jesus came to, to get them to come back to God, to help them know God. But He came into His own and His own received Him not. He came and He was the perfect example. He was and is the Word of God made flesh, but they rejected Him. And they would, Jesus says they would, would reject the Son and they would kill Him. That happened, had not happened yet in Mark 12. But Jesus was about to be arrested and was about to be killed and crucified for them. He says that God sent His only Son and you'll even reject Him. God's desire for His own people was to help them bear fruit, to bring Him glory, to hear His Word, to follow the Word of God, to learn the truth, to believe the truth, to be saved and live for God, but they wouldn't do it. So what would He do? What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandman, will give the vineyard unto others. We'll, get to, we'll talk of this more later, but God's judgment did come to Israel even after this day. And God did set them aside. Why is it that most churches are filled with Gentiles and not Jews? It's not that they don't have an opportunity, but God for a time has set them aside. They're not completely replaced, but God does emphasize the Gentiles. God says, I will set them aside and give my work to another. And He did. So number one, there's the doctrine. Number two, let's look at the duty. Back in Mark 12, verse number two, it says... And at the season, he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. So when Jesus gave this parable, he was speaking to a group of religious leadership leader Jews that would not believe and would not follow Jesus. This is interesting. This parable is terribly hard or strong and convicting. But there's a parable that was mentioned before it in Matthew's gospel that's not mentioned here, that adds greater strength and piercing to it. Let's go there, Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Sometimes, by the way, you know this by now, while you're finding Matthew 21, sometimes uh, not every book shows the same stories. Not every book shows the same parables. So there's, it's not that they're incomplete. It's just different writers, different human penmen. Didn't, uh, God didn't lead them to include every detail. Um, if He did, there would be four completely 
copied books, right? So Matthew 21, there's greater emphasis of different things in here, and aiming to Jews in, in Matthew, but Matthew 21 in verse 28. The parable bef- or the story before verse 28 is included in Mark, and the parable after what we're about to read is in, in Mark as well. But Matthew 21 verse 28, what think ye? A certain man had two sons. Again, Jesus speaking to the Jewish leadership. What A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. Every mommy and daddy would feel very uh, bothered. Son, go do this for me. No. That's what he did. He answered and said, I will not. But, a- but afterward, he repented and went. Okay, that, that's pretty good. Verse 30, he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go. I go, sir, and went not. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? He answers it in verse 31, but let me ask you. Cooper, go take out the trash. No. Boy, go take out the trash. Okay. <laughs> and he goes. Cooper, go take out the trash. Okay. I'll do it. And then he lies and doesn't do it. Which one's better? The one that said no and then got right and did it, or the one that said yes and lied and never did it? The one that repented, got right, and actually obeyed. Jesus here, I turned away from it. But in in Matthew 21, let me show you the the harder-hitting part. Jesus says to the Pharisees, "This this is you. You're the one that said, I'll do it but then didn't do it, would not obey God. You pretend, you act like you're good, you act like you're spiritual, you act like you're obedient, but you're not. Which, whether them twain did the will of the Father, they say unto him, the first, Jesus said unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans, so that's tax collectors, greedy, dishonest government workers, not every government worker is, but then he says greedy thieves, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Jesus says the ones that said no and got right, those are the publicans and those are the harlots. Jesus says the ones that act like they're religious and act like they're sincere, the ones that act like they're spiritual, but they're not, they're not as th- those type of people, which he says that's exactly what you are. The publicans and the harlots, they're better than you. That's a hard thing to hear for a spiritual leader. Prostitutes and and government thieves are better than you. That's what Jesus says to them. They weren't very happy. So with that understanding of the backdrop, then Jesus says, by the way, there's a work that God gave you, and you're not doing it. You say that you'll do it. You agreed with the Father, with the Master, that you would do a work, but you're not doing it. So Jesus gave that work to the Jews. It's a confrontation of a religious crowd being made aware of God's instruction, pretending to do what God said and pretending to be something that they're not. God says, you know better. You have the Word of God. You're the people of God. You were given the temple. You were given the tabernacle. You were given the scriptures. You were given the law. You were given my presence for, for millennia. You were given that. But you're not using it for God. But we can take this. The Bible says that all things are written aforetime for our learning. Just because Jesus said this here to the Jews doesn't mean it does not. It does not mean that it does not apply to us. The Jews were given opportunity to live for God, but they didn't use it. They were given commands and they didn't obey them. They were given the ability to produce fruit and they didn't do it. John fifteen verse eight says this. This for all believers. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Do you know what God wants from you? God wants you to be a disciple. It doesn't matter Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter what your nationality is is at all. God fully expects you and commands you to be a disciple, to know the Word of God and obey the Word of God. Discipleship does not equal salvation. But if you're saved, you ought to live for God. The result of salvation ought to be you are a follower. You know the Word of God. You obey the Word of God. You care about the Word of God. You spend time with God. You pray. You spend time in His Word. And you ought to obey as God leads you. And when God convicts you, you ought to get right. You ought to be a disciple. God fully expects every child of God to be a disciple of Christ. If you're not, you're not right with God. Every Christian ought to be a disciple. You know that. You have the Word of God. As the Jews had the Old Testament, the Gentiles were, for the most part, the Gentiles were given the New Testament. Yes, Jews, for the most part, wrote the New Testament, but most of the epistles were written to Gentile churches. 
Old Testament Judaism is different than New Testament Christianity. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants Jew and Gentile to be saved. But the main emphasis of God's work today is with Gentiles, with, with people like us. We are responsible. We're the ones that God says, I'll give it to another. God's given us a work to be disciples. God has given us His Word to know and to learn and to study and to get in our heart. The life and the time and the purpose that we have is supposed to be used for God. By the way, they were working. They were active and they were busy. But they would not give God what was rightfully His. Let me show you a couple of verses. Go to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And then after this, we'll go to Romans 12, but 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? In other words, the temple belongs to the Holy Ghost. It's His. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What was the parable about? God says, Jews, I've given you a work, I've given you responsibility, I've given you a life, I've given you fruit, that you're, I, I, I've been working through you, I fully expect you to give me everything that is rightfully mine. No. We're going to kill your servants, we're going to reject your prophets, and we reject your son. They refuse to listen to God. God says, it's time for you to give me your fruit. No, it's mine. I'm keeping it. Paul says to the church of Corinth, Gentiles, your life ain't yours. Your body is not yours. Your time is not yours. Your life is not yours. You may not go as far as, you may not be a scribe and Pharisee, but God says everything you have is not yours, it belongs to God. It's you are bought with a price, you're bought and paid for, you belong to God. All of you, your marriage, your children, your job, your career, your finances, your free time, your hobbies, everything in your home, everything outside of your home, everything having to do with you, 100% of it belongs to God. If you withhold any part of it, then that parable is aiming at you. Don't hold back from God what is rightfully His. Romans 12, verse 1. I'll just read it for time's sake. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, says Paul says this, these churches at Rome, I'm begging you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Folks, we need to get this. Maybe maybe not everyone in this room, but Christianity in general, and I would imagine some folks in this room, and me at times as well, we need to get rid of the idea that Jesus is just a side thing, that Christianity is just a hobby, that, that, that I should give God part of my life. And as long as God has a bit of my life, at least on Sundays and maybe even Wednesdays, as long as God has part of my life, then that's all that He asks. If somebody told you that, they lied to you. God rightfully deserves every bit of you. Every part of your life is God's. In any, in any time we withhold from God what's His, we're stealing from Him. God says, I'm, I'm sending a preacher this Sunday morning. I'm trying to tell you what's rightfully mine. And we can say, no, 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 I'm keeping that. I'm holding part of that fruit back. I know the Father, He owns everything. I know He put me on this earth to bring Him glory, but I'm keeping it for me. Our duty is to give to God everything that's His. If you exist, it's because God created you, God made you. If you're saved, it's because God purchased you. You twice belong to God. 100% of you belongs to the Lord. The duty. And then thirdly, we see the danger. Mark 12, verse 9, What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? This is serious. What will the Lord do with those that reject the warning? And you may, again, part of this may not apply to you. 
So I didn't put Jesus on the cross. Actually, you did. You may, not have be, you may not be personally responsible for killing John the Baptist. But what's the point? Keeping back from God what's His. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. I mentioned this earlier, but this happened. And we've talked about the last couple of Sunday nights 513 B.C., something like that, and the, when the Babylonians took over Israel and Judah. That's not what we're talking about. This happened again. This is probably not the authority on all issues, but it was a good, simple illust- uh, summary of what happened. According to Britannica.com, and I know, I, I know these things to be true from other places, but it was a good summary. In April, in April of 70 A.D., so 40 years after this parable was given, About the time of the Passover, the Roman general Titus besieged Jerusalem. Since that action coincided with Passover, the Roman pilgrims allowed, I'm sorry, uh, the Romans allowed the pilgrim there, the people there, to enter the city but refused to let them leave, thus strategically depleting food and water supplies within Jerusalem. Within the walls, the zealots, a militant anti Roman party, struggled with other Jewish factions that had emerged which weakened the resistance even more. Josephus, a a Jew who had commanded rebel forces, but then defected to the Roman cause, attempted to negotiate a settlement. But because he was not trusted by the Romans and was despised by the rebels, the talks went nowhere. The Romans encircled the city with with a wall cut off to supplies and thereby drove the Jews to starvation. There's more detail, but in 70 A.D., Jerusalem was destroyed. Jews were killed. They rejected. Jesus said, Jesus told them before that the temple would be destroyed. That's what he's talking about. He will come and destroy the husbandmen. That's what he's talking about. They rejected Jesus, so he set them aside. What Britannica.com doesn't know is the motive, the reason It wasn't just military. It wasn't about land. It was about God. They rejected God in their life. They would not obey Him. They would not receive Jesus. So Jesus was, God set them aside. Again, now God focuses on the Gentiles, preach the gospel to every creature. We we are the benefit of the Jews' rejection. But let me show you another verse. Go to the end of the Bible, Revelation 2. Again, we take, we take this parable and we apply it. We can't take every detail and say we equal that. We don't equal the Jews. A lot of those truths that were given to the Jews are applicable, but one does not equal the other. But let me ask you a simple question. When I was studying this, it made me think, is there anywhere in the Bible that shows that if a Christian or just, you know, if a Christian or a church know the truth, and reject the truth, and know that they should live for God, and refuse to live for God, that God would set them aside. And Revelation 2, setting aside is a very nice way to say it. In Revelation 2, verse 5, these, there's seven letters to seven literal churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And here in verse 5, we find part of the letter that Jesus sends to the church at Ephesus. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. So remember where you got away from God, is what he's saying. And repent and do the first works. He says, church, get right with God. It's time to get right with the Lord again. Or else. I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The same kind of warning, and I'm almost done, the same kind of warning that Jesus gave personally to the Jews. He gave to this Ephesian church that we have the book of Ephesians written to, by the way, that does not exist today. Jesus says to this church, get right with me 
Live for me again. Get your heart in the right. Don't just start getting busy again. That's service is part of it. But get right with God. Or I, or I will remove your candlestick. What in the world does that mean? It can mean a lot of different things. He doesn't define it clearly. I will, at the very least, I will remove your light-giving influence. I will remove your church status. There's lots of churches in America that have, church on the, they have the word church on their sign. They may even have Baptist on the sign, but they're not a light for the Lord. They've been dead for years, but they're still filling the room. There's Christians, they're saved. They exist, but they haven't lived for God in years. God's not using them. God's not blessing them. God's not speaking to them. They've told him no so many times and turned him off so many times. God might say, fine, have it your way. God says, I'm trying to get fruit out of you. I'm trying to teach you to live for me. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to, trying to grow you. And we can say no, 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 and God can say, fine. I'm going to, I'm not, it's not, it's, it's not talking about losing your salvation. It's not talking about a saved person going to hell. He's saying, I'm just going to be done with you. I'm going to set you aside and find someone else to be used. Our light can be extinguished as a church. The light of our church can be extinguished if we become a church full of part-time Christians that aren't really concerned about living for the Lord. We can be that. Jesus said that to that church. Why, why is that one special? Why are we special? Again, this is a serious warning today. This is what the text was. <laughs> Jesus wasn't playing. He wasn't joking around. But God gives us a warning. You may be religiously minded like the scribes and Pharisees. God may be part of your life. You may live by somewhat high standards. You may live in a, with a bit of Christian culture, with a Christian-y type background. You're here today. You at least do that. But God is not asking for you just to show up for an hour or two throughout the week for church. God is looking for you to give 100% of you to God because you are rightfully His. Anything less is thieving, robbery from God. So God looks at you today. Where's my fruit? It's time. It's time for, I'm looking for fruit today. I want to see you living for me. By the way, there is a reaping day. There's a rewarding day coming when we will stand before the Lord. And Where's my fruit? What did you do for me? But our lives ought to be wholly, 100% dedicated to God. From the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, for God. From the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, for God. Every ounce of you, everything you own, everything in your control, for God. I'll end with this. Is, is, is that your life? Does God have every bit of you? He ought to. Thank you.